This meeting is being recorded. Thanks Amen. everyone for joining. We're going to get started in a moment. All right, we have a lot of panelists today, so I'm going to get the meeting started. Welcome to the August 2022 webinar on governance of health data. I'm Olivia Velez, and I'm co-chair of the Global Digital Health Network. Um, can we just move to the next slide for a second? Thank you. <laughs> so I just wanted to remind everyone of our upcoming Global Digital Health Forum. We just closed abstracts, and it's going to be taking place December 5th through 7th. Um, we'll have both a live and a virtual component. So the virtual component will primarily be um, in early hours for our colleagues in Asia and East Africa. Um, and then we will have an in-person component at the Crystal City Gateway Marriott in Arlington, Virginia. And you can uh, take a look at our website there down at the bottom. And we hope um, you're all able to join us virtually um, or in person and uh, registration should be opening soon. So thanks everyone, and I'm going to turn it over to our presenters today. Thank you, Olivia. Uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, I'm going to stop share my slides. And uh, um, so welcome to this uh, uh, amazing panel where we have really great panelists uh, who's going to be talking about with us a very important topic the health data governance. Uh, uh, today, uh, my name is Teddy Berigun. I will be facilitating this panel. I am the Director of Information Systems at the Palladium Group. And uh, um, as you all know, uh, this important topic, the health data governance principle, has been a long time coming. Uh, there is a lot of people who have involved in designing, developing, and getting to this point. Thanks to them, I think, uh, we have also some perspective from countries. Uh, really appreciate the uh, representative from DRC and Kenya uh, to walk us through how this implementation has been happening uh, in both countries and the impact it has. So um, the first part of this agenda will be uh, Vidya walking us through how the health data governance principles, what, the, what they are and uh, what the process was and so on. Uh, and then, um, Trial Hatton and Amadou um, would, would give us the from PATH would give us the perspective from uh, DRC uh, side. And then Dr. Sintile from MOH Kenya uh, would also be able to talk to us about the uh, implementation of these principles, uh, especially as it goes along with the protection law that came in effect in Kenya. Uh, and then uh, how it can provide the balance that it needs uh, with this uh, the health data governance principle in the sector. So without further ado, I would invite uh, Didia to start her first presentation and talk to us about uh, what this uh, health data collaborative and governance is. Didia, back to you. I'll stop sharing. Thanks, Teddy. I hope everyone can hear me okay. Uh, let me know if you can't. Um, if you can move to the next slide. Um, so I'm gonna try to focus primarily on the health data governance principles, but I just wanted to take a step back initially and just to um, talk a little bit more about why it's so important. Um, so 
my background is, is, is as an epidemiologist, and I've been working in ME for years across a number of different um, vertical programs and technical health areas. And so coming from an epi background, a lot of aspects of health data governance have been part of our work for years. Um, but within our industry, within our projects, um, across our donors, it really has become more important in recent years as our health systems have been, have been increasingly digitalized. So this has resulted in an exponential increase in the amount of available and easily accessible health data. And as this has happened, it's become incredibly important or more important to ensure that this data that is readily accessible, that is helping our programs is safe and secure, and that the individuals that this and communities that this data pertains to are protected. Um, so there's been a very clear acknowledgement that we need um, better and more equitable governance of that data. So in support of this health data governance um, focuses on making sure that there is more equitable and responsible management of our data um, while we're safeguarding data privacy, ownership, and security. Next slide. So this has been acknowledged by a number of different stakeholders and donors, um, including OECD, the WHO in a health data governance summit last year, um, the Lancet and FT Commission, um, as well as WHO. So there's been kind of this clear um, and growing groundswell to move forward on this. Next slide. So several years ago, um, the Health Data Collaborative and Transform Health, along with a number of other stakeholders, identified a clear need for a few deliverables, including um, a series of foundational health data governance principles. So this whole process really started from the ground up. It was driven by a series of consultative workshops that focused on inclusion of civil society groups. Um, so our focus for the workshops was to make sure that there was a very diverse and meaningful um, set of stakeholders to ensure engagement. So based on these workshops, um, feedback was compiled and um, Throughout this process, Transform Health and other partners stewarded this to use this to um, put together a series of foundational principles. Um, next slide. So these principles really focus um, on applying a human rights and equity lens. They are at their core all about universal health coverage. Um, and they're intended to support sustainable and resilient public health systems. And you're gonna hear me say equity and equitable over and over again, but that really is a foundational part of this. Um, they have a shared vision of equitable health data governance. Um, one of the goals across all of them is to maximize the public health data, uh, value of our data while making sure that we're balancing that with the need to protect individuals and communities' rights. Um, and they serve as a critical step toward a uh, global framework for health data governance, which I'll speak to and allude to a little bit later. And one thing that's really important and one way that these differentiate themselves from other um, principles and resources out there is that they are applicable to um, all stakeholders. They're not organization or role specific. Next slide. Um, <clears throat> so one thing to keep in mind before I talk through the principles a little bit is that they are each designed to complement and reinforce each other. They're equally weighted, so there is no objective or principle that is more important than another. Um, and each of the principles, each of the eight principles are within them supported by core elements that describe how they can be put into practice. So the three objectives for these principles are to protect people, as individuals, groups, and communities to promote health value um, through data sharing and innovative uses of data that we have, um, and to really prioritize equity by ensuring that there is an equitable distribution of the benefits that come from health data, and actually make sure that there is a meaningful feedback loop. Next slide. So these are the health, the eight um, principles spread across the three objectives, and I'll speak to um, each of these and the objectives in a little bit more detail. Next slide. So as we're talking about health, um, about promoting health value, so under that objective, um, we really wanna make sure that health data governance is thought of as enhancing health system efficiency and resilience. 
Um, so the goal is to improve health access and advance health equity toward as we move toward universal health care. Um, so a whole system, a whole health system approach must be applied um, to ensure that HDG, HDG supports the systemic transformation of health systems. So data sharing and data collection and sharing is kind of a prerequisite for creating value from this health data, but it really needs to be done in ways that support equity and human rights. Um, so once we have this data, sharing it allows for a deeper and much more um, significant insights related to health needs and challenges. Um, and health data governance really should enhance health system efficiency and resilience um, to make sure that we are taking existing health data and using that to facilitate innovation. Next slide. So another objective is to focus on protecting people. Um, so particularly for innovator for implementers who are um, providing services to individuals, this um, will be a focus of your work. So health data governance needs to focus on protecting not just individuals, but also groups and communities against harm and violations across every stage of the data life cycle, regardless of the format of data. Um, so one interesting thing that um, this objective these principles talk about is not is taking things further than just thinking through individuals, but also considering concepts like collective consent, um, where individual consent may not be um, the most effective. Um, so health data governance should make should focus on reinforcing trust in health in data systems and practices. And developing health data systems um, needs to be done in a participatory and transparent manner. Um, to ensure that regulations and guidelines are actually accessible, well understood, and if this is followed in practice, then this can really help build trust in our data systems. Um, and finally, as we're thinking through protecting people, data security is really an essential component um, to ensure that we're protecting individuals and communities and our processes across the data lifecycle for collecting, processing, storing, using, and um, disposing data, they really all need to em employ robust security mechanisms. Next slide. Um, and last but certainly not least, um, the third objective, um, the third in the order that I'm using today, um, is to prioritize equity. And um, this essentially says that health data governance really needs to ensure equitable representation and data of all individuals. So as we're doing research, we need to make sure that we are, that we are adequately representing all groups. Um, and there needs to be meaningful participation of all groups in decision-making and equitable access to um, data generated health value. So this includes things like making sure that research results are shared back with the communities that the data is reflecting. Um, additionally, health data governance needs to be needs to very clearly acknowledge ownership, um, data rights and sovereignty. So data related norms, principles and policies and laws need to be drawn from this and need to reflect these overarching rights. Um, so this, of, of course, includes consideration of human rights, but also acknowledgement of the rights of other stakeholders who are involved in these processes. Um, so with these principles, um, they are a very important foundational element. And for many of you here who are familiar with the principles for digital development, you should think of these as analogous to those. Um, so these are things that we should consider in any programs that involve data, which is likely um, something that we all work with. But moving forward and taking more practical steps, um, we're beginning development of a health data governance framework that will have more practical steps toward this. Um, so as more and more organizations are endorsing the health, the health data governance principles, I think it's at least over 90, if not over 100 organizations. Um, some of the next steps are to <clears throat> both take action around the World Health Assembly and really champion the need for a global um, resolution calling for a health data governance framework. And at the same time, the Transform Health and the Health Data Collaborative are beginning work on a country-focused health data governance framework that will kind of outline 
uh, more practical and foundational elements of what health data governance should actually look like in countries. Um, so I'll stop there for now um, and hand over. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lydia. Um, really wonderful that you captured the uh, essence of this uh, health data governance and principles. Uh, all the um, groundwork that has been done and the, all the collaboration and the discussion happened from all around the world is really impressive. So I would like to reiterate uh, this data health data governance, you know, the three aspects which are not in any order. So I'm going to change the orders that she presented to emphasize that they all are equal. Uh, so we promote health values to protect individuals as well as prioritize equity. And they are not tied to any of the uh, organizations because it, it really uh, brings about all the stakeholders together. These principles are applicable to all stakeholders, whether you're a donor, a government, uh, an individual, and so on. So uh, thank you for all the uh, excellent work that has happened so far. And stay tuned. There is more practical aspect of this is coming and how you can be implementing it within a country framework. And um, we appreciate uh, uh, everybody who's involved with and uh, able to get it to this level. Uh, so uh, having said that, I think, you know, we still have uh, more presentations and uh, Rod Haddon and uh, going to be giving us the first perspective from countryside from uh, DRC. So, Brad, uh, the floor is yours. You are on mute. Okay. Can you hear me, Teddy? Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you now, Brad. Great. Thank you. <clears throat> um, uh, thank you to Vidya and uh, uh, for her uh, setup presentation. Let me set my timer here. Um, so my name is Trad Hatton. Uh, I'm the country director for PATH in the DRC based in Kinshasa. And I will be joined on this presentation by my colleague Amadou Fall, who's based out of the PATH Senegal office. Um, I think the, the, the perspective we will bring for this presentation is sort of the big picture look at data governance through um, the DRC um, that is going through a, a massive uh, process of reform and digitalization. Um, and so get data governance is integrated throughout the process that, uh, that we are accompanying uh, the DRC through, as well as other donors and partners. So uh, again, the story is really about uh, the DRC. So I shared two quotes from the from the Minister of Health that I think are important to, to understand the story. So the first quote is really says, investing in digital technology is no longer a choice in DRC. It's now a strategic vision supported by the political will at the national level. So that's the president himself. Um, and second is that the process that we're going through, a digital square uh, developed process, um, we're at a step of an investment roadmap towards the digital transformation. Um, to catalyze the digital platforms around universal healthcare. And universal healthcare is the second big contextual point here. Um, the DRC is, is, has initiated uh, universal healthcare uh, and it's, it's a massive reform of the system. It's the biggest reform of the system since independence 62 years ago. Um, so very briefly, we'll glide over these, but just so you know who PATH is, you know, we are an uh, international NGO based in Seattle with an office in, in uh, Kinshasa and a staff of 120 around the DRC. We're specifically the implementers of the USAID Digital Square project in, in DRC, uh, which is known as supporting the Rep Democratic Republic of Congo, Congo's digital and data initiatives and health system strengthening. And specifically for the purpose of this presentation, we'll be looking at the one of the roles that we have is to strengthen national level digital health expertise to enable decision making, which is largely um, you know, where we get to the data governance and sustainable implementation. So since 2018, we've been supporting the DRC and we've gone through this long governance process um, of support 
and you can see those six, six steps at the top. The first is really to initiate um, national level digital health leadership and governance. And the government chose to create a digital health agency and we were in support of that. Then the digital health strategy, step two, uh, needed to be developed. And the current step which we're on is the development of an investment roadmap. It's been a six month process of over 60 institutions to identify 17 priority investments for the DRC to catalyze the digital transformation. An immediate next step, and this is what Amadou will talk about, is to define the health enterprise architecture for universal healthcare in the DRC. Um, that's a will be a long uh, process. Um, and then finally, to identify and coordinate relevant digital tools, and then over time um, to support systematic data use for good decision making. Here specifically are the three objectives of, of Digital Square and DRC in 2022. And again, uh, the first being building the capacity of the agency, which we're working on. Second, the investment roadmap, which I'll introduce you to. And third, the enterprise architecture, which is what Amadou will talk about. So this is a single slide summary. Like I said, it's a, it was a six month, or well now a nine month process of uh, developing a consensus among stakeholders on terms of priority investments. Um, so these investments are spread out over three years, $36 million with three main objectives. Um, the first objective that you see there is coordina coordination, standardization, and interoperability of solutions for in implementation of a single and reliable health information system in the DRC. So directly we're talking about data. And so there are specific investments, which if anybody was interested in, I could share later. Um, the second objective is really uh, operational. So DRC is the size of um, Western Europe. It's the size of the United States east of the Mississippi. So taking digital uh, systems and solutions to scale uh, is, a, is a pretty massive undertaking. And that's where um, we seek to catalyze that through objective two. And then objective three, there's my five minute warning. Uh, and then objective three is uh, building human resources capacity. Um, we cannot imagine this transformation without being supported by a new and expanding cohorts of staff who have a digital health capacity. So with that, um, let me hand it over to Amadou. Um, he will describe paths process for the development of enterprise architecture. Uh, and this is something that has been gone going in Senegal and is now being initiated in DRC very shortly. To you, Amadou. Thank you, Trent. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? Well, yes. Yeah, I'm, as Trent uh, mentioned, I'm Amadou Fahal. I'm technical program manager at PATH and based in Dakar office in Senegal, supporting our digital effort within the countries uh, in the region. Um, we will be talking about enterprise architecture, uh, why it's important uh, for our efforts that you, we are doing. We can to, to answer this question, what is enterprise architecture? We can say it's like an architectural blueprint of a house. When you are building your house, you have to have that architectural blueprint. You have to define how the doors and the kitchen will be communicating. Your rooms and all the piece, all the rooms in the house will be communicating. So bring it to the to the health sector is to define how that would align that would be the alignment of the information system that we have how our goal in our strategic plans and our mission and our objective are linked to our digital system, are aligned. So with that, uh, we can say that the objective of EA is to align health sector and digital strategies and to align health sector and digital agilities and, and the evolution of the digital world and the digital system that we have in our countries. So to establish a, a, and refine future architecture vision and to govern digital decision and direction. So this is quite a, a some bunch of uh, objective that we can say that this is EI, what EI would like to attend. Um, so what, what are the, the steps? So we have the architecture vision and uh, to define the architecture, the vision from uh, multiple sectors and I would say from multiple entities within the Ministry of Health from the national strategies, strategic plans and the 
of course, uh, to define the business aspect of what are our business processes currently, how the system are, in, in the, uh, are, are communicating. And in terms of business architecture, we can we should define uh, in the same time uh, as is what are the business processes, of course, and what we want to, to achieve by doing that. And also, uh, we we uh, we have to talk about the information uh, system architecture, which is the data, how the data flow are, how how the system are communicating, how the data are, are being shared, and what we would like to do in the future. So, and also we, in terms of technology, how the infrastructure are currently in, 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 the, in our system, how, how are the infrastructure and how we would like to be efficient by using this infrastructure. And of course, uh, we can see the opportunities between, uh, I can say, okay, if for uh, commodity management, we, we, we use uh, DHIS2 or another tool, how we can leverage that, how, how we can say that, okay, this tool can be used in the same time instead of having two tools, et cetera. This is what we were defining here by communicating, discussing and, and having this panel of EA. And also, of course, we can talk about the future. How would be our migration plan? To all those would be defining and the implementation governance, the architecture change management, of course, uh, that will define the, the future. Next slide, please. Trade. Sorry, I'm having a hard time. Oh, there. Okay. Can you see it? Yeah, I can see it right now. Thank you. Yeah. So uh, this is another uh, way to see the enterprise architecture. In so we we can say that we have the functional ar architecture, which where we will be defining the principles, the objective, and the policy, and of course the business architecture. So that's very important uh, for us to uh, to to look, take look at this carefully because these are the big this is the beginning and where we will be having people make sure that we have the right people we have the right scope the right team and the, the, the vision this is where the vision will be defined and the, of course we we will be defining the business processes and the information system data will flow and the policy existing as is in the country and how we would like to improve that where we are going, what we want to achieve by stating that. And of course, in terms of information technology architecture, we, if we set it like this, that's where we will define how the system will, uh, will be interoperated. Are these systems aligned to uh, the international standards? Um, uh, so which is FIRE, HS7. So to make sure that our interoperability will be smooth and aligned to what is currently existing in the global world. and. Uh, and of course, that's where I, we have the application where we can we can advise or where we can talk about which system, which application we should use, which software we should use at which level. So all those will be defined in the information architecture. Of course, the infrastructure is very important to discuss how the country, what are the capability of the country to and how we can uh, put together all the infrastructure that are currently existed and that we had in mind and how we should improve those information. And of course, the, 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 the architecture transition and to disseminate. So these are the steps that we can see that our journey would be uh, for uh, um, to define the enterprise architecture for a country in the health sector. Uh, in Senegal, we already started uh, doing our enterprise architecture by having a scope to define the team who will be uh, leading those activities, who will be doing this. And of course, we already had a vision. As you can see in, the, in, in, in Senegal, what we defined as a vision is we accelerate universal access to high quality health and social services through a robust digital system that produces real, reliable and secure data to support decision making. So this is what we've defined in Senegal, uh, that what we wanted to, to see how uh, this is the start and we have the scope and now we will move to the next phase will be the business processes and the information system data flow analysis and to define the policy so uh, in drc you have a few more slides i'm sure straight uh, will be sharing this we have a few more slides to explain 
specifically this, this, the, 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 the case of DRC and how we would like to apply it. I would pause here and thank you for your attention. Thank you, Amadou. So back to you, Teddy, the additional slides are for background. And so um, they can be shared uh, if it's useful, but I think we've come to our time. So we turn it back to you. Excellent. Thank you, Amadou and Fad, uh, for this wonderful presentation. Uh, as everybody could see, I think you have given the bigger perspective where uh, digitalization is becoming a key aspect of uh, health uh, in many of the sub-Saharan African countries these days. Everybody is trying to get the national digital strategies being developed and then uh, in order to govern that, you know, uh, is there, whether it's enterprise architecture or other forms of architecture are taking shape uh, in many of these places. And it looks like Digital Square and Path has been supporting DRC in this important journey. And uh, Amadou was able to put for us in a very clear manner how the architecture is being used for um, prioritizing, governing, uh, interoperability, uh, as well as uh, you know how it's, it relates to uh, the topic of the discussion today in terms of the uh, principles, the data principles. So that architecture is the entry point where you will be able to link all of that uh, principles within uh, the implementation framework. Um, there is a lot more information, I think, you know, with, with the limited time that Fred and Amadou will to share, uh, are not sharing here the investment plans and all the different you know the six major steps that they have taken within the rc in order to get to the point where you know they are able to see some of the results of uh, these kinds of organizations within the uh, health data space so thank you for that uh, there are a few questions on the chat that which i will come back to you uh, for, uh, so that you can give more explanation uh, but uh, let me stop here and then give the opportunity to Dr. Sintile from Kenya to walk us through again the perspective uh, uh, from Kenya side. Dr. Sintile, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Teddy and Chair, and thank you very much for the organizers for inviting us to, to be part and parcel of this conversation. It is extremely exciting for us to be part of it. And uh, I'll now take you to the Kenyan perspectives when it comes to the adoption of the data governance. Uh, I hope you can see my slides. You can put it, yeah, perfect. Yeah, so I will be taking us this afternoon or evening or morning, depending on where you are, to the adoption of the health data governance principles in Kenya. Um, before I even uh, say something about what you can see on, this, uh, on, the, on the slide, I would like to quote Cliff humbly who is a mathematician from UK who said that data is the new oil. And I think all of us are fully aware about that fact and the fact that there is a lot of scramble for health data, especially in Africa and also Kenya being part of that, that people are really interested in the health data in our space and how that data is managed thereafter to the fullness of the value chain in terms of reaching the apex and that is innovation may not be something that uh, has kicked off uh, quite appropriately. So looking at the Kenyan context, uh, most of our systems have been paper-based uh, system. Since 1972, when the Kenyan government recognized the need to have a health information system and the need to collect health data. Uh, for your information, for those who don't know Kenya, Kenya got its independence in 1963. So nine years later is when we decided to have a health information system. And along the way, uh, since 1998, so from 1972 to 1998, we have been fully paper-based and we've started to migrate now to the hybrid system uh, where we are starting to collect uh, electronic medical records from 1998 to 2003. This was the opportunity that also gave Kenya a major stride in trying to digitize some of the systems, but at the same time also created systems which I would call disease specific or project specific or m &E systems, which uh, looking back uh, the future now, we can clearly see that these systems do not uh, really answer the 
questions that we want and it cannot push Kenya to achieve the universal health coverage and to provide for quality services as uh, required. So we've started now to do some form of digitization. And in 2010, Kenya began with the adoption of the DHIS2 that I think all of us are fully aware about. And that is a system that has been in use for quite a long time. However, DHIS2 has its in inherent challenges considering the fact that uh, it is a service uh, aggregate. Uh, and of course, the way we feel the services aggregates every day has a lot of questions raising the quality of the data. But now we want to up our game to reach uh, somewhere where we can all, as a country, be comfortable and happy. So what is the rationale for us to have started this work? First, what I've just said, that data has, is an integral component of the health uh, sector because without data, we cannot plan. Without data, we cannot make proper informed decisions. And even if we plan or we make decisions based on uh, data that is uh, of low quality, then we expect that the, the outcome of that decision or planning will equally be the same. As they say, garbage in, garbage out. So depending on what goes in, it will determine of what comes out. And of course, there's been this increased demand for data from many players in a country like Kenya, particularly from partners, from the government, from implement, implementing uh, partners, from donors. This has meant that uh, we really need to think about data governance. And of course, the evolution of the data, health data has re resulted in identification of key aspects that require formal guidance. These include, of course, health data in the context of a devolved system. Kenya voted for a constitution that has been implemented since 2010, which created two tiers of uh, government, the national and the sub-national county uh, governments, which we call counties. And each of these has its role to play. But of course, devo the, this devolution led to implementation also being devolved to the counties meaning that counties now have much more feeling that they own the data that they generate and that now we need to rethink about uh, these issues surrounding data in that context. Moreover, uh, partners also have the opportunity to work directly with the counties since they do not directly reference to the national government. And that has also complex, uh, complicated the matters surrounding health data. <coughs> Sorry for that. We also have to bear in mind that uh, the ecosystem uh, that has now come into context for digitization and innovations, such as the use of telemedicine, has created an added strain on issues to do with the health data, particularly access, storage, and data sharing. And I'll be coming back to this because now we have the laws that govern this uh, in this in a country uh, in our country, Kenya. Again. We also have to think about the health data in the context of research uh, and surveys that take place periodically. For example, demographic health surveys, researches that are conducted by either training institutions uh, of higher learning or institutions that are focused on data, uh, on research. And therefore that has also created the issues surrounding data access and the storage of that data. And that the health data is not only directly linked to individuals such as health equipment and monitoring, uh, of course, we are all fully aware that uh, the new equipment that are being used in the health facilities do generate data, and that data is individualized. And sometimes we also have data through the back end that goes, for example, to the, to the source of the equipment uh, for whatever purposes. And that also has created the need for us to look at uh, how we can be able to manage health data subsequently. Oops, now my slides are frozen. Uh, sorry, now my slides are not uh, advancing. I don't understand what is happening. Oh yes, now they have started again. Uh, so that
Um, I think we might have lost uh, Dr. Sintiles. I think you are correct. <laughs> um, so, Teddy, do you want to go ahead and maybe oh, move on with um, some of the Q and A, and if we can get him back, we can have him finish. But to just yeah. keep going. Great. For sure. Yeah. Uh, for interest of time, I think uh, there are some questions that are from uh, the participants. And most of them are directed to DRC. Uh, so I will uh, read them and then uh, Prad and uh, Amadou would, would take turns to answer the questions. Uh, so uh, I think, you know, uh, given that you have been pre presented about the uh, enterprise architecture, one of the question was to see how the links between enterprise architecture and interoperability happens along that line. Uh, they are also talking about uh, questions about uh, uh, what are the key components to make the uh, links between, you know, uh, the different ministries and Ministry of Health. What, are, what is the point of contact? I think, you know, uh, again, around the uh, enterprise architecture and, and along with the, um, you know, standardization of data. So uh, that smooth interactivity and interoperability happens. And then, um, I think those two maybe we can we can start from those two and then we can add uh, other questions. Uh, Amadou or Trad, uh, I'll give you the chance. Uh, yeah, I see am that I jo still Joseph allowed... has returned. Yes, I think technology is letting me down. This is classical of what we are discussing here, and perhaps if you don't mind, uh, I've had to change my source of. Uh, of internet, no, some, reason it, some reason it just waited until I was making the presentation is when it went off. <laughs> Sorry for that. No problem, glad to have you back. Yeah, so yeah, I don't know if you can see my slides. Yes, if you can just, yeah, it's in the presentation. So one. I, I will try to scroll through, uh, I don't know at what stage I lost you. I think I had given you the first rationale why we had to develop uh, yes. the, so if you saw that, I'll now quickly go to the second rationale. Yeah. Oh my goodness, this system is- So crazy. we are really left with uh, uh, five more minutes uh, for you to go through these presentations and- um, So you have already uh, discussed this uh, slide. Yes, I'm trying to advance my slides, and again, it is refusing to advance. If you can just, you know, summarize, uh, I guess, uh, if technology is failing us uh, for the sake of time, you can just summarize oh, this, the key yeah. concepts. Yeah, that would be good. Unfortunate, yeah, that uh, technology is really letting me down. I was talking about the Health Act which has given the powers to the national, to the ministry to develop a national comprehensive integrated system. And then based on that, we now have a data protection act that has categorized health data as sensitive data. And the consequent has been that uh, the demands to the health sector to review and revise the existing uh, guidance on data governance policies, which led to the Kenya health data governance framework that I'm now going to take us through briefly and it builds on the previous uh, data system governance and change management framework, which has incorporated these existing legislations. And also it provides guidance that is responsive to the insights drawn from counties and other stakeholders who have been involved in the process of developing the system. Uh, so yeah, as you can see, the first thing is to do with the constitution of Kenya and the constitution of Kenya 2010 uh, provides that every person has a right to the highest attainable standard of health, which includes the right to healthcare services, uh, including reproductive health. But the key thing here, which is aligned to the principles, is the chapter four of the constitution, which talks about the Bill of Rights, 
and partly the right to privacy and the right to timely and comprehensive health information. The other legislation that is in place uh, here is the is the, this law that is the Health Act 2017 that provides for uh, provision of e-health services, which again uh, we'll, we'll, we'll be looking at slightly later in my presentation. I'll talk about that briefly. And also the fact that the ministry has to develop an integrated system. And we also have this law, the Data Protection Act, which has taken care of the rights of the data subject that health data is owned by the data subject while the government is the custodian of the health data. That is extremely important in our context that health data is owned by the data subject while the government is the custodian. I'll move quickly here. They, we, we also have the, a draft of the bill that will soon be tabling in parliament that will be looking at the data collection, transmission, storage, and use. Uh, this is again because we are now moving away uh, from paper-based systems towards uh, digitization. And again, of course, that will have to create a data management or a data governance uh, subsection to take care of issues to do with uh, governance and specifically to anchor the policy now on the law. And of course, that will also take care of disclosure of personal health information, including the, uh, coming up with innovations through uh, telemedicine and such like innovations that are going to come up as we proceed. Uh, Chair, again, we have the health policy in Kenya that runs from 2014 to 2030, uh, which highlights health information as one of the key eight policy orientations. Mainly the Kenya health policy uh, is hinged on the, uh, the eight building blocks, the building blocks, the WHO building blocks of health systems. And this builds uh, towards ensuring that health information is critical and that it cuts across all the other concepts. In addition, this is what we just talked about, the data governance and change management framework, which was, which was done in 2018. And because we are moving forward, we are now revising this towards making sure that it captures the actual reality as it is in the ground as right now. So the basic consideration for the adoptions of the health data governance principles are basically two. The first one is the lawfulness, and you will see how this relates to the Kenyan law. And then the next one is the apl applicability. If you look at the Data Protection Act principles, which I have highlighted on the left chair, and I don't want to go through them, you can see how they are tied to the health data governance uh, objectives uh, in terms of protecting the people, prioritizing equity, and promoting health value as a spectrum. And this is clearly articulated in this slide, which demonstrates how these two are tied and it builds to each other very, very well. And that is the reason why Kenya has adopted uh, the, the health data governance principles. In terms of applicability and specifically across the value chain for data, we've also looked at the protection of the people and the principles that underlie how you protect those people. And then we looked at the, the value chain from the world, from the moment we call, before we collect the data through that process of data collection, storage, processing, until we dispose of the data. If at all, we have to dispose of this data. And that again has been scored in line to see how this is fitting within our system. So the, the, the development of the, uh, the system itself has taken us through some uh, steps. I would like to propose that uh, in our data governance uh, framework, we think it should run from 2023 to 2027, and then subsequently it will be revised. So that is a proposed uh, date. We have seven uh, chapters, as you can see, from chapter one, which will be dealing with introduction and then situation analysis, the architecture, the governance principles, where we are going to pick heavily from the principles that we've talked about until we reach the monitoring and evaluation. The last parts will be having the consent forms, and these consent forms uh, will also be used, including the sharing agreement. Because of time, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but can you wrap up in the next one minute? I'm actually finalizing, Chair. Uh, so we are going to pick from the Data uh, Protection Act tools. Uh, and basically that is how we've done it. 
uh, we, have, we have gone through the process of development through a consultative process where we've uh, involved all the people who are necessary to do that, including having virtual meetings and physical meetings with the responsible people. So in summary, uh, health data is sensitive and that uh, it has evolved over time to the point where digital health has taken center stage as it is right now. There are existing legislations on health data that should be managed in the country, particularly in our, in our space, through the directorate that uh, I sit in, the ministry is currently restructuring the data governance framework to ensure that it optimally responds to all the relevant stakeholders and that the Kenya data governance framework will provide guidance that will ensure health data is managed as sensitive data and that's according to the law, but at the same time optimize its use for relevant policy making and innovation. And with that, Chair, yeah, I would like to thank and to recognize that some of the people who are seated here, who participated, who have participated in this work. Uh, particularly, I would like to flag out uh, Pascal and uh, Steve Wanye, who have been part and parcel of this. Thank you, and I'm sorry for the technology issues that uh, we had. Over. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Sintile. That was really wonderful presentation. That really put a perspective directly how the principles are really mapped against the laws that are passed in Kenya in terms of data protection. So I like the phrase that you use, lawfulness and applicability. It is within the law of the Kenya government that took this as an initiative and then directly shows how it's been applicable within the sector and then relates to the principles. So. I'm sure you know, if we had more time, we would be able to see each of these mapping for all of the objectives that are outlined by Vidya at the beginning of the presentations. Because of time, I'm gonna go directly to Trad and uh, Amadou. Uh, please uh, start answering the question and then we'll invite uh, the Kenya team for further questions. Thank you, Teddy. <clears throat> so um, one of the, uh, I'll answer the question regarding uh, linkages. Uh, between uh, <clears throat> this system across different sectors, and I'll hand it to uh, Amadou for uh, EA questions. I'm going to share my screen um, so you can see um, the uh, universal health care. Can you see my screen? Yes, I can see it. Okay. So this is in French, and I don't expect a lot of French speakers on the call, but this gives, if you see on the top, this is the composition of the Universal Healthcare uh, Council, including the president, the prime minister, uh, and the director of the cabinet. But if you look below, what's really interesting, I think, and surprising for many, is these are the, these are the ministries that have to be involved to effectively deliver universal health care. The one um, that I think is, <clears throat> is uh, useful to call out is... Uh, that around transport, because some people, which is infrastructure, travel, public, public. In Kinshasa right now, traffic accidents are, a big, are the biggest cause of morbidity and mortality. But there's no traditional linkage between the health sector and the transport sector. So creating linkages between all of these ministries or these sectors is, will be necessary for, data, for the data governance of universal healthcare. So it's a massive undertaking. Um, you know, health represents roughly 20 to 25% of the term of health in DRC. And all these other sectors, be they health, be transport or water uh, or road infrastructure, uh, make up the rest. So um, to, to answer your question, it, there's a lot to be done. Uh, and, and the process of linking all of these sectors is really what the enterprise architecture process is meant to do. So let me hand it over to Amadou for that. <clears throat> So, Trad, thank you. Uh, I think that's a, that's a very uh, FAQ question that you just brought in here when it terms when you talk about enterprise architecture. Um, for me, in our, uh, I mean, by by bringing this EA in the health system, we don't have to uh, live on in count each any system, uh, whether if it's from private sector. Or it is from public sector because most. If, if I give the example of Senegal in here, we uh, we have um, um, a lot of uh, system that are currently run by by partners like that are currently hosting 
system. So if you design your enterprise architecture without including those information systems, so you might lose a lot of, lot of, lot of information. So of course, yeah, that will be part of the plan. For instance, we made a map to, 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 to map out uh, existing system and we, we identify, we've identified, of course, uh, the, the private sector or uh, some other uh, system that are not drawn by the government. Uh, and I will, uh, I will say also, uh, again, enterprise architecture that will answer to, to the question from on the chat from my friend Usman Lee, enterprise architecture, the, the difference between enterprise, the link between, between the enterprise architecture and, and interoperability, I would say enterprise architecture is not about technology, is how we use it how we use the system. For, for interoperability, for instance, we will define how our system will be interoperate, how they will communicate, but not the interoperability it, itself. So, because these questions sometimes, always people uh, make the uh, link, even me, when I first started working in, on EA stuff, uh, we always mix up between the two. So that's why I wanted to, to see. So for the data, the that data, of course, this is something we should start thinking. Thank you for bringing this question because we sh should, by building our enterprise architecture, think about the future because those data could be the future because we have a lot of, lot of, lot of knowledge uh, on in terms of using this kind of data. I'm talking about learn deep learning. I mean, using this data because in health you have a lot of uh, data and we should think about it when in implementing our enterprise architecture in our countries. Thank you for bringing that up. So we think about how we can leverage that. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you both uh, describing the relationship between enterprise architecture and interoperability and how it helps us to link up with other systems. Uh, there are so many questions here. I don't know if we can go through all of them, but maybe uh, from I will give the opportunity to uh, Dr. Sintire to talk to us about uh, one in respect of the dark data uh, that might be introduced into the system uh, that might affect, is there any practical way that you were able to address within your country on how this uh, dark data is uh, managed, uh, if, if any? If they, I know this is nascent and early on for many of us uh, in this space and uh, managing you know, this data being introduced into the system to impact uh, the other data that are useful within the system. But if there is any, uh, like like the one, the laws that you passed on and the systems you're managing, if there are any practical ways you have tried to address this, maybe it would be good to talk about it. In addition, you know, from Kenya perspective, you know, you talked about from these multiple systems that are already existed in the country, and then now you are integrating uh, this, this specific programs into a platform uh, yeah. to manage the data better. Uh, again, the question is uh, how you, is there a way to still get the benefit of these individual uh, systems that are uh, managing specific disease uh, uh, while also uh, having that integration at the highest level? And then if there is any practical way you handle that again, if you can walk us through that. And please, Steve and Pascal, you'd be happy if you can uh, chime in to support uh, Dr. Sintili as well. So, so thank you for, for that question. I can see Wanye and Pascal in, uh, in, the, in, in the call. They can also chime in. I, I would like to state from the onset that uh, we are moving away from uh, disease-specific uh, solutions. We are moving away from project-specific solutions towards an integrated solution where we are not even focusing about the statistics at the beginning. We are focusing on the patient. That's why I say the system that we are looking at and what the government is now developing is disease is patient centric. In other words, the patient is at the center. And uh, as the patient seeks services within a particular facility, when they are moving from triaging, uh, from registration to triaging, triaging to consultation and all the rest, data is being picked at the back end which we can now look at them in terms of uh, reporting and after mapping the data elements that are required. But as the patient is moving around, they are getting services that they need. In that way, if the solution that has been in place, and we have quite a number of them, 
which perhaps were particularly disease specific and uh, maybe even m &E systems. If you are dealing with an m &E system, which means you looked at a reporting tool and started to digitize that and say, you have now digitized the system, we're asking you that that is not what we want because that is an m &E system which focuses on the system. And this, in this case, I'm talking about the health, health system, the health facility and the health system. But we want systems that focus on the patient or the, our clients. In that way, then you have to up the game. So we are also looking at, if you look at the, which I was unable to present is the architecture that we are deploying. We have interoperability layer that allows integration of all systems to, uh, for meaningful exchange of patient level data, not uh, statistics, not elements of statistics, but the patient level data. This will enable the patient to move from one facility to another facility and still through the shared file to be able to, for the next facility to be able to see uh, the details of that particular client or that particular patient. And these cuts across whether you are in the public sector, in the private sector or in the non-state sector, uh, sectors so that the systems enable that movement of data along uh, to enable comprehensive and complete care to that particular patient. We know, for example, that there are patients who are double counted, patients who are duplicated because they move from one facility to the next, perhaps seeking a particular uh, form of care, or uh, some of them have become uh, agents of collecting medicines. So when you move to the next facility, it is very possible to know the clinician who will see you will see that you are in a particular facility yesterday, you got the following services. What is it that you need over and above what you got yesterday. And that also goes across uh, to deal with the, either the labs or any imaging uh, sites so that the, all this is put into this one file for the patient. And that is what we call a shared folder. And that shared folder or shared file is what will be available at a centralized point. Uh, and uh, that goes across. In addition to that, for us to be able to achieve that, of course, there will be some standards that we need to look at. Some of these standards include uh, standards on terminologies, which we have started working on, and Steve Wanye is here, who is really assisting us, and Pascal, uh, to make sure that we have a national uh, data dictionary. We already have that in place. We are also thinking about other standards which may not be there at the moment, uh, that we have to develop them if they are missing, or to put them in place in the event that we need them. And these are the things that we are now working on within the Kenyan space. Uh, I guess my colleagues who are seated with me in this uh, uh, session can also chime in, Stephen and Pascal. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Sidine. I just wanted to add a little bit of uh, context to the implementation of the enterprise architecture in Kenya. So um, that's, that's also providing the thrust. Uh, so the enterprise architecture that we are refreshing, uh, supporting the ministry to refresh has four components. Uh, it has the business processes, it has the technology, the applications architecture, uh, and the data architecture. So the health data governance implements the data architecture uh, from the enterprise architecture. So the question around the, um, the dark data, or maybe some would call it the exa exhaust data, uh, becomes more of a concern as you uh, take a patient-centric approach to development of your system, because there's a lot of data that is generated more than what is used. So then what we're looking at supporting the ministry to do is then how do we ensure responsible use of all the data, um, whether for service statistics, for patients' care or for public health response, uh, how does the ministry then ensure that there's responsible use and equitable use of that data uh, to support uh, uh, stated uh, ministry objectives and priorities? So I, I think in a nutshell, I think the health data governance principle then help us to probably uh, ground uh, those principles in the implementation, but also uh, provide proper guidance. Uh, what is the role of the different sector players, whether private or state or non-state, uh, uh, or, or um, you know, uh, private sector, public sector, uh, what are their roles in ensure them, ensuring the responsible use of the data? 
So I'll hand over to Steve if you have anything further to add to respond to that. I know we are all time, Pascal, and um, so I, I, I think all, all I'll add to what you said, and Dr. Stine, is, uh, is I think just to highlight the importance of leadership. Um, uh, for me, I think uh, that is one thing that has been extremely clear and that makes all the difference. So, uh, so really just um, um, acknowledging the, the strong, firm, visionary leadership from Ministry of Health through Dr. Stine, it's really something we can't take for granted. And so I think just encouraging the global digital health community, I think let's continue investing in leadership. Digital health leadership makes all the difference. Thank you. Thank you all. I know we are uh, over time, uh, but uh, thank you for all the wonderful presentation and answering some, uh, some of the questions. I think what we will do is we'll share the, the remaining questions that are not answered uh, to you and then uh, we'll share out to the participants. Uh, uh, thank you uh, for your time. I think for the closing, I will ask uh, Kerry to come on mic and, and do the closing. Thank you, everybody. Yes, thank you so much, everyone, for joining uh, the, our webinar today on the governance of health data. It's been really exciting. You've asked some amazing questions. Um, and I really want to thank um, uh, Teddy and Vidya and Trad and Amadou and Joseph and Stephen and Pascal, all the panelists, for being here today. We really thank you for your presentation and your thoughtfulness um, and how you've answered the questions that we've been able to answer. So thank you so much for being here today. We've just learned a lot from you. And obviously, as you've seen in the chat, um, what you've shared has been really thought provoking and encouraged a lot of questions. So thank you so much to all of you. And thank you to all of you that joined the webinar today. We really appreciate it. Before we go out, we just want to remind you that if you have not uh, joined the Global Digital Health Network, please, um, we encourage you to sign up and be a part of our community. So with that, thank you again, everyone, and we will see you next month for our next webinar. Thanks again, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, everyone.